आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy i am manoj keval ramani and today i have with me general prakash menon and we are going to be talking about uh, the tensions that are uh, currently sort of in place at the lac Uh, in eastern ladakh between india and china um what we are going to try and do in this episode is we are going to try and break down uh, and answer the sort of more simple questions and then look at the more sort of broader geopolitical strategic dynamics of all of this so that everybody gets a sense of what the area is like what the dispute is like and why we see what we see and what are the takeaways from it um and i can think of no better person to explain all this in general menon um so general menon thank you so much for joining us thank you um so let's begin first with uh, you know looking at uh, the fact that we're recording this on june 5th which is a friday tomorrow uh, on june 6th uh, we know that the commanders from both sides military commanders from both sides are supposed to be meeting for a conversation about easing the tensions that have been there and it's about a month now uh, that these tensions have existed the first reports that tell us is that the first scuffles that took place currently in this current uh, dynamic were on may 5th um so can you first explain to us uh what the geography of this area is and why do we see these routine scuffles before we sort of come back to uh, the current situation yeah so actually uh, the border in ladakh is about 857 kilometers with china and out of this 857 only 368 is actually the international boundary which is a recognized boundary line between the two nations and the rest is what comprises of the line of control the line of control is an imaginary line which is based upon the perceptions of both sides on what had transpired at the end of the 1962 war and the indians and the chinese believed that after they have withdrawn this is what their the line of control is so it's an imaginary line but there are different perceptions to this line now this entire area is also high altitude mountainous and therefore it is not possible to defend each inch of territory so from a military point of view you defend only the major ingress routes and china would probably do the same hmm. so there are large areas which are not occupied they are not only really not occupied they are also not under 24 hour surveillance so this makes it possible for both china and india to go to a place sit down and claim that this is they belongs to them because there is a dispute about the line of control now in 1993 agreement between the two nations they had decided or they had stated that they will formalize between themselves through talks and negotiations the alignment of the line of control but china has resolutely refrained from coming to a mutual recognition of the line of control so it remains an area which can be exploited and therefore if you include if you connect that to the type of the two decades long preparations of defenses and communications in tibet they have developed it into a pressure point because the concurrent developments on our side there has been and they are not inconsiderable either does not has not kept pace with what the chinese are able to do they have better lateral lines of communications uh, they are able to actually move faster than us but the indian capability has improved over a period of time and let us not just discard it by saying that we have no capability we have considerable capability especially in ladakh 
but we could, could always be better. So we are talking about an area which where China can actually carry out what you would call salami slicing and then claim that they have done it because it is either their territory or because the Indians, it is a preventive move because Indians are violating their territory. Gentlemen, we'll, we'll get into the reasoning a, a little later. I just want to stick on the territory for a minute. So uh, you explained that this territory is uh, in, in many ways very uh, inhospitable, mountainous, high altitude, uh, very cold and obviously therefore not necessarily great for uh, it's not fertile land in any which way and also very difficult to uh, you know monitor every inch of it in that sense i wanted to understand what is it about uh, so i get the fact that the chinese have not given us a clarity about where their perception of their boundary lies but what is it about uh, you know this dispute that makes it difficult to resolve from from an indian perspective so i can i can see the fact that territory uh, becomes a matter as a, as a principle you look at your you define your territory and then you say that this is a matter of integrity of india uh, so that is a principle is what i can see the other i can see is that from an identity point of view as you start demarcating borders on maps uh, they, those become part of public consciousness and national consciousness um, and therefore it becomes part of your identity also so political identity therefore matters but from a strategic point of view how strategically important is this territory, whether it's looking at it from a military point of view or from broader strategic interests in terms of India's connectivity with Central Asia? So Ladakh is important because Ladakh, actually there is no dispute about Ladakh. It is a, The dispute is about the boundary between Ladakh and what was Tibet and now what is China. That is the dispute. So the, the question really is whether... Chinese have any intentions to take over Ladakh? Uh, I don't think, firstly, they are militarily easy for them to do that. And even if they do, I don't see what they gain. But what they can do in strategic terms is to use this nibbling and salami slicing to create and use it as a pressure point, as a leverage. And that's what they have been doing not only here, but all across the Sino-Indian border, they've been doing it in South China Sea. And this is the way they have been operating for quite some time. In fact, the Indians have tasted the, the, this technique of theirs because uh, they've been doing it for a long period of time. And we have in certain places lost control over territory because we are not there. And the Chinese have just taken over. In fact, one of the places which was very clear is actually Bhutan, where they have actually taken over a lot of territory and very recently the Doklam Plateau. So the Chinese, the strategic threat is not about loss of Ladakh. It is about the fact that they can create it as a pressure point against India, primarily to send a message, which probably we need to discern. So in itself, it doesn't amount to much. But what it does is it can be connected to a larger issue. And that is what the Chinese do. Okay, so let's look at this current uh, current situation that we are in. Like I said, uh, the, it's it's been really messy in terms of the reporting. So there's like multiple reports all around. Uh, even forget what the Chinese might want us to believe. There's multiple reportage, bits of reportage even in India in terms of whether uh, the level of ingress, uh, whether claim lines have been shifted uh, and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the lake uh, where apparently all of this is happening, Pangong So? Okay, actually, uh, uh, let's say that this time, this is how the drama unfolded. And that's all subordinated in the first week of May, nearly a month now. But there were three places. One was Nakula in Sikkim, where they came. They wanted to actually ingress, but where they were resisted. And that situation apparently has now calmed down and diffused. At least... The Chinese is not in possession of any territory which they claim that is so Nakula situation is there. So that is in Sikkim. In Ladakh, yeah. there were two areas. And the one area which you referred to is the Pangangso Lake, and the other one is the Galwan Valley. So let's go to Pangangso. Pangangso Lake has actually been uh, a, a site of a lot of standoffs 
and it is on the northern bank of the lake where there are eight fingers towards the sh lake shore towards india is actually finger 1 and then we have control up to finger 4 where we have uh, adam base and finger 4 to 8 is actually china so normally when things are okay india sends a patrol up to finger 8 which is our claim line and the chinese patrol come towards finger one and two and go back. So what has happened now, and this has happened before, but this one has a slightly more greater significance because the duration has already been one month, that the Chinese have blocked us at finger four and would not allow our patrols to go ahead to finger eight. So the, 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 the Chinese seems to have now taken at least temporary physical possession of the area of their claim line in Pangansu. That's what it is. That's that's interesting. That's at least clarity in terms of what's being said because there's been so much, such confusing reporting that, I mean, I've been receiving so many messages and emails saying, can you explain this? And I said, it would be better if somebody who's actually been there can explain it to you. Um, but this is great. I think this is perfect. The kind it's of clarity one of the most made. beautiful lakes you can ever see. I've seen it and it's beautiful. Uh, one can hope for peaceful times to actually go and travel and look at it. But let's now look at sort of uh, the broader sort of geopolitical dynamic of this. And, you know, the big question that everybody has, not just in India, but even in other parts of the world. So you and you probably sort of explained this a little bit already when you said that this is a uh, strategic sort of pressure point that the Chinese tend to use. Why would you think that the Chinese would be interested in this at this point in time, given the sort of dynamics uh, internally itself for Xi Jinping uh, with sort of, you know, there are tensions with Taiwan, with Tsai Ing-wen winning a second term. Uh, there are tensions with Hong Kong uh, escalated to uh, the worst that it's ever been since the handover in 97. Um, the US and China are locked in what seems to be a slippery slope of confrontation and sort of heading towards much more dangerous times, um, particularly with regard to COVID. And there's lots of pressure with regard to COVID itself on the Chinese economy, uh, if not at least the international pressure with regard to the origins of the virus and all that. Those maybe have ceased, right? So seem to have sort of calmed down right now. But the economic pressure is a long-term issue for China. So why open another front with regard to India? And is it should we look at it as opening another front? So I think before we actually go there and answer that question, let's just, let me just give uh, this thing about the second spot called the Galwan Valley spot, where, where hmm. actually a, a, a bigger confrontation than the Pangangso is, is taking place. I mean, that's a much larger one. The Galwan Valley is actually a valley in which a river from the Aksaichin area, which finally comes and joins the river Shio, Shio, which flows initially towards the southeast and then takes a U-turn and goes and goes via Turtuk into Pakistan or quiet Kashmir. So it is in the Galwan Valley where there is another trouble spot has sprung up. And here, unlike Payangso, there was the claim, this is a new claim line. There we thought it was already a settled, that both had an understanding of where we were. There were no confrontations earlier. But now they have apparently come in and pitched their tents, some temporary fortifications perhaps, and have asked us, in fact, to stop constructing a bridge, uh, which we were doing to send our patrols across, because in those areas, in winters, the rivers freeze. So you can walk across, but in summers, it's not crossable by on foot, so you need a bridge. So we were actually constructed. But that area is, you know, according to us, much in the area which we have never considered it to be disputed. But now the Chinese say that you can't construct that bridge. And hmm. they've also come in from what we thought was their claim line and telling us that we are now the aggressors here. And it was to prevent our aggression that they have actually had to do what they had to do. It, according to them, it is a defensive measure. So the hmm. larger confrontation is actually here in the Galwan Valley and where the Chinese have come beyond their claim line, unlike Pangangso. And that is a matter 
which we need to note. So both yeah. these, all these three have taken place together. That's another point which we have to need to understand. And if it has taken place together, let us be clear that it had the concurrence and under the orders of the Central Military Commission, of which Xi Jinping is the leader. Yeah. So this could not have been done overnight, probably planning for this would have at least started in the month of March. And it has been done not because there is a military problem down below, it is being done from the top. So once you, I think we accept this fact, then it is much more easier to understand as to what is the purpose. Hmm. So if the Central Military Commission is involved, as we can, I think, reasonably assume that it certainly is, then we must look at what is the larger game here. And as you said, the question which intrigues us is what people are asking is when they are actually under pressure from so many directions, which you have listed, why would they want to open another front? I think we are asking the wrong question. That's not how China looks at it. Or that's not how Xi Jinping and his uh, uh, leadership, which actually governs China, and that is actually more of an oligarchy than actually a large collective which decides. For them... It is about using this time to finally leverage it for what they have always claimed that they want to be or to be is not about changing the world order so much as about taking control of the world order. Because the guy who was supposed to be taking control, the United States of America, is actually uh, under Trump, shown all sorts of indications that he is withdrawing from his larger company. Therefore, it's a nice time for the for the Chinese to not change the world over, just have to take, take it over because there is a vacuum which somebody is leaving behind. So within this takeover, where does this fit is the question which we have to ask ourselves. And then probably you get the answer that China perceives, probably perceives India to be in the way of this takeover of the existing system. Hmm. And therefore, to pressurize India at this point in time would make sense. Otherwise, hmm. it doesn't. Yeah. And it doesn't take much for them. After all, the type of force that they are using is very small. Hmm. They have created a, a, a situation which can be embarrassing for the Indian political leadership because the Chinese have already bitten off what they want. Hmm. Now they are saying the situation is stable and under control. That is the description of the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman. Which means we have done what we want. Now the Indians can try to ask us to get it back and then we'll take it from there. So the question is, and that's the question which Indians have to ask themselves. If you want to actually negotiate now, what leverages do you have? So let's look at that. Let's look at that question. Uh, because I remember in our in conversations that we've had, you've spoken about how this is not necessarily war as we have conceptualized it in the past. Uh, this is a different kind of conflict where, uh, you know, all sorts of things are involved, including extensive sort of uh, psyops where, you know, like we've, it's no coincidence that suddenly we are seeing reports in the Global Times about, you know, uh, things like uh, unmanned helicopters being deployed and other things being deployed or satellite imagery being easily available about uh, these models of Ladakh and that area being built in China and things like that. So firstly, how should we start conceptualizing responding to this conflict? Because it does seem like this is something that's going to be around for with us. It's been around with us for a very long time and it seems like it's going to be around with us for a very long time in this particular approach of, the, of Beijing. Um, how do we first think of responding to this and what is the nature of this conflict, this new sort of conflict that we are seeing? Okay, first let's get clarity on the military situation. This is how China operates. It's done this with a small force, but the message it sends across is that we've got a much larger force waiting and therefore we can do much more if you guys make trouble. Okay, so that's the messaging about the maps, about armor moving, about many thousands of troops and all is that messaging which they're sending out. But military leaders on this side know. See, 
whatever people might criticize, I can give it to you that the amount of preparations that have been undertaken, and they are not, certainly never enough. In the dark, as far as military preparation is concerned, we are well prepared. And that's one thing which we need to understand. Although the larger a narrative with the Chinese are able to convince and some of the Indians have convinced themselves is well, they are too strong, we can't stand up against them. We must actually uh, disabuse ourselves of this notion. That time is over. We are now mm-hmm. much better prepared, even if China more, even if China tries a much bigger thing. But my point is, China will never try that because that is not China's intention. China is not intention about capturing the dark. It doesn't make any sense to it to capture Ladakh. Neither does it want to actually capture any part of territory which it wants to keep and gain any advantage. Nothing of the sort. Hmm. As I said, this is about the larger game. So this thing about the military situation, once we get clarity on that, then how do we deal with it is what the issue is. What are the leverages that we have? Militarily, what leverages can we have? Let me just finish that off. Militarily, we certainly have leverages. All we have to do, and that takes a bold political decision. In fact, I would have said we should have done it already, is we could do the same thing somewhere else. It's it's, it's not so difficult. And that's where the bread and butter of the military uh, on the Sino-Indian border is. The only thing is, the politicians must take a risk because there is no... No knowing as to where they'll go. But in my in my understanding, it's a risk well worth taking. Once we do that, then we're in a better position to make a negotiation. The second thing is, since we are talking about a larger game, the leverages which we have is about, I think, one, this thing was already, has already been shot. One, one bullet has been shot when Prime Minister Modi has spoken to the Australian Prime Minister, talked about a strategic partnership, about offering bases to each other and so on, which I see in this morning's paper, it is also a signal to this guy that yeah. if, you, if, you, if you are going to push us here, this is what is going to happen. And I think it is the biggest leverage India has because a guy who can spoil his dream or a king, at least act as a spoiler may not build is India because we have the size and the capability to do it. That is our political power, which we must leverage. So we are well in a position to continue to contain this themselves wherever they have come, to do what we need. We must do it with a great deal of thought after making sure that we do not sacrifice anything of the future. That's, I think, what we did in Dokla. And that is why Doklam, although claimed as a victory for India, the message the Chinese got is that we can put these guys under pressure. Because mm. even when they, not, as, not, not that they violated the agreement, after they have physically occupied, built fortifications, made it into a military base, the rest of Doklam plateau, except the site where the uh, de-escalation took place, which is a very narrow site, India has kept quiet. Hmm. So, Chinese have understood that these guys can be frightened. We can put them under pressure. Hmm. So, this is what they're trying to do here. And at least I hope we have learned the lessons from Doklam because it was followed by Wuhan and Mamalapuram. And we have now reached here. So, Hmm. I hope this time we don't make the same mistake. That we actually must realize and must have the self-confidence that we have the strength. Chinese power, military or otherwise, cannot wholly be directed towards India. China has problems across its eastern seaboard in any amount of measure. That is why this calculation that the Chinese have become very strong and we can't do anything does not understand the concept of relative power. All power is relative power. If it cannot use the entire power against us, We should also not use it in the measurement to compare ourselves. So I think, or hopefully, this time we would actually give them that message. Then we can talk. Yeah. But if the military leaders are talking and that tomorrow if they're talking, I individually do not have much hopes on the talks. What cannot be started out at the brigade commander and the major general's level can surely 
not be sorted out at the left and generals level because here it is about getting them to vacate and establishing or re-establishing the status quo. Hmm. That is primarily what we are saying. That we yeah. go back, don't change the status quo, which they have. Yeah. They have not agreed to the military guys on three rungs of the military, the battalion, brigade, and the and the major general. I don't think they will agree to the core commanders level. So hmm. if we if we since we know and I think that's a reasonable investment that this is from the CMC, the core commanders, I don't think, can come to an agreement. But what is good about the whole thing is not a shot has been fired. All the violence has been used. People have hit each other. And yeah. I think that's a very great, uh, this thing about both sides not wanting to escalate it beyond that because this is not that sort of escalation. It is about messaging. Hmm. That is why there's no firing. Yeah. Because to message, you don't have to fire. And the Chinese yep. are good at it. They've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Territorial conquest for them is not about sending large armies to capture large amounts of territory. Yeah. It's about occupying mostly unoccupied or unpopulated areas and claiming it. Yeah. That is what they've been doing for several decades. With us, they also they've been doing the same thing. We need to recognize them. So to think that this is about a military maneuver. To have a strategic advantage, I don't believe that. So it's interesting, right? I mean, it's interesting that uh, the idea that they've been doing this for a significant amount of time and this is about messaging. And the moment you actually fire the bullet, uh, the messaging is lost uh, because it changes the game altogether completely. Um, Thank you so much, General Menon. Thank you so much for this uh, episode. It's been extremely enlightening. uh, And I'm sure for all of our listeners, this will become an essential listen uh, in all the cacophony that surrounds uh, the current dispute. Thank you so much, General. Thank you very much. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, Check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. It really has been a great week this week. We've had two of our first international cricketer show of people who have played for their respective sides. We had WV Raman come on Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast. If you haven't heard that, you should be listening to that if you enjoy cricket. It's really one of the best out there. And you should also definitely check out Monty Panisar, who showed up on Cyrus Says. Uh, That was another really interesting conversation that occurred. If you haven't been listening to a few of our shorter shows, please do that as well. Ashish Vidyarthi has been doing a great job for us. we got 30 episodes now on Begin the Journey. I think you'll really enjoy that show if you haven't listened to it. It helps you with, like, you know, understanding what's going on in this tough time and how do you deal with it from a mental health perspective. We've also had some really fun stuff come up on the Smile India show. Shifa has been doing a lot of really good stories over there. Things would just make you happy. So definitely do check that out. And on the more serious side, make sure that you're checking out our regular shows like the Pragati podcast, All Things Policy. They're definitely going to keep you up to date on what's going on in this COVID world. And thanks for listening. And we hope to catch you again next week. Are you constantly seeking happiness? Wondering how to make the most of every day? How not to let your inhibitions stop you from achieving your goals? It's now time to get your A-game on. It's time to unlock your true potential. Tune in to the empowering series with me, Zarina Punawala, to feel empowered in all genres of life. From behavioral skills to management skills, from health to relationships, from mental well-being to emotional well-being, and of course your finances. I've got you covered. With these tips and tricks from me, Zarina, and true life stories from my amazing guests, you're bound to bring your purest to the table. Tune in to the Empowering Series with Zarina Punawala every Thursday on the IVM Podcast app, website, or wherever you listen to podcasts.